So, madam, we are live now. We are starting the program. So, good evening, doctors and all the participants. Uh, Ashuman on behalf of uh, Shield Healthcare, welcoming you all in uh, today's session on ovulation induction in uh, PCOS. And our uh, guest speaker is uh, Dr. Komal Singh, madam. Just before starting the session, uh, let's have a glance on our Shield Connect uh, platform, which is basically a knowledge sharing platform of uh, Shield Healthcare. Here we can find uh, different blogs written by many eminent doctors uh, in the blog section across India. And uh, these are the webinar uh, scheduled uh, uh, that, uh, that is uh, present and uh, the past webinar schedules are also there. And the most important thing is our key opinion leader. So presently more than 1000 doctors are currently supporting us this knowledge sharing initiative of uh, Shield Healthcare. So now it's time to start the session with uh, Madam uh, and it's my honor to introduce Madam, Madam Data MBPS, MS OBS and Gani from PMCH Patna. Madam is the HOD, head of the department and senior consultant at Tata Central Hospital, Jamapura Dhanbad. And in terms of academic activities, Madam presented many uh, presentations in various seminars, conferences and webinars as well. And uh, she got first prize in free paper category at the annual conference of DSOG 2019. First prize and best speaker award for PG paper at the 57th conference of clinical society Tata Main Hospital 2019, organized community health awareness programs on cancer screening, adolescent health, contraception, menstrual hygiene, antenatal care for women, and many more. And in terms of area of interest, uh, she is having a keen interest on uh, this high risk pregnancy, infertility, and preventive oncology. So, with this uh, brief introduction, I request Madam to take over the session and uh, I request all the participants for your active participation on this session and please drop your uh, queries on the chat box of the Shield Connect page. So once the talk will be over, uh, we can have a short discussion on this topic with uh, Madam. And uh, thank you very much, Madam, once again for your valuable time uh, on this uh, knowledge sharing platform Shield Connect and uh, over to you, Ma'am, for further postings. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. At the very outset, I would like to thank Shi for giving me the opportunity to speak on the topic of evaluation induction protocol. Infertility is one of the most frustrating medical and social problem of the couple. And to treat these patients success, successfully is one of the most satisfying achievement for any treating doctor. So today I have tried to present various ovulation induction protocol, which will help, help us in our day-to-day -day practice. So without much ado, let us start our presentation. So what is an ovulation? It is the failure to release an oocyte from a mature graphene follicle during a menstrual cycle in a postmenarchal premenopausal woman. Usually it manifests itself as irregularity of menstrual period that is unpredictable variability of intervals duration of bleeding. And most of these women have oligomenorrhea, arbitrarily de defined as menstruation that occurs at intervals of 35 days to six months. So uh, WHO class, let us know about the WHO classification of ovulation disorder. WHO has ca classified the, these disorders into three classes. So it, uh, type one is hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. It is uh, the lesion is central. In these condition, there is low FSH, low estradiol, and normal prolactin levels, and these can be caused by a lesion affecting the pituitary or hypothalamus, uh, which affects gonadotrophin release. Second group cons consists of normal gonadotrophic hypogonadism. In, the, in this uh, condition, usually the FSH level is normal. There is normal estradiol and normal prolactin. And the commonest cause of anovulation and is, and is the most commonly cause of PCOD. 80% of uh, cases of PCOD belongs to WHO type 2 uh, group. Coming to WHO type 3, it is hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism. In this condition, there is high FSH, low estradiol, and normal prolactin, and it indicates an ovarian failure. Now, what happens in uh, 
group one in these condition the as i already told uh, you that it has got low estrogen level low fsh low lh and uh, normal serum prolactin and uh, the women with who uh, class 1 and ovulation will not uh, respond to any kind of treatment with clomiphen citrate and the treatment for this uh, group consists of uh, injections like uh, gnrh gonadotrophins which you, which contains uh, lh it, it will not respond to any type of uh, ovulation induction drugs like clomiphen and letrozole Now coming to the group two type of, in class two patient, women who fall in uh, uh, this group have a normal le level of gonadotrophins. And the majority of anovulation of women occurs in the female who has polycystic ovarian disease. And this condition could be treated with uh, in, in the, uh, inducing agents like clomiphen citrate, insulin sensitizing agent like metformin and gonadotrophins, especially recombinant FSH, urinary FSH, or urinary, urinary FSH uh, LH, which is also known as HMG. Now coming to the group three. In this group, women uh, have high level of uh, gonadotrophins with low estrogen. The chance to conceive for women in this group is very low. And if they are able to conceive, the risk of miscarriage is very high. And response to any kind of hormonal treatment is very poor. The only effective treatment for women in this group remains IVF with donated oocyte. Now, what is the management options? Oligo ovulation and ovulation unrelated to ovarian uh, failure can usually be treated as successfully with ovulation induction. This is especially for class two type of patients. These women achieve fecundability equivalent to that of normal couples. 15 to 25 percent of probability of achieving a pregnancy in, is in the one menstrual cycle. So there is only 15 to 25 percent chance of achieving pregnancy. So the method of uh, ovulation induction that is selected should be based upon the underlying cause of an ovulation, efficacy, cause, risk, potential complications associated with each method, drug availability, accessibility of choice to treatment to patient. So what are the management options? Management options include weight modulation, clomiphen site, citrate or other selective estrogen receptor modulators, metformin or other insulin, insulin sensitizing agents, aromatos uh, inhibitor, gonadotrophin therapy, laparoscopic ovarian dr drilling, bromocryptin or other dopamine agonist. Only in cases of hyperprolactinemia and, uh, and ovulation, we can give bromocryptin on ART. That is uh, we, in, in class two type of patient, which is usually in uh, polycystic ovarian disease, we can uh, divide the level of uh, treatment in three groups. First, uh, first line of treatment is uh, lifestyle modification, uh, or we can uh, uh, induce ovulation with the help of clomiphen citrate or letrozole. And if there is failure, we can go on for gonadotrophin therapy or with or ovarian dr drilling. Even then, if the uh, patient doesn't conceive, then we proceed for ART. So most of the these as I already told that most of these approaches are effective for WHO class two patients. WHO class one patients respond best to therapy involving less lifestyle modifications or gonadotrophin. While in WHO class three patient, it, they respond to gonadotropin uh, therapy and in vitro fertilization. The, but those who fall, fail also require oocyte donation. For so you see, in WHO class one patient, uh, we can treat them with lifestyle modifications and gonadotropins. And for WHO class three uh, patient, they do not respond to anything. So they have to go for IVF or with oocyte donation. So basically, uh, we are giving treatment to uh, class two type of patients, which uh, include polycystic ovarian disease. So adequate history and phys physical examination are essential. Adequate patient counseling and patient information uh, are, is important. And we should correct any underlying disorder like thyroid and uh, other diseases and diabetes. 
uh, how, how optimize health before starting any therapy, exclude other causes of infertility like semen analysis, test of tubal patency, TFT, etc., as indicated. And we should induce unifollicular uh, ovulation. Now, this is the flow chart showing uh, how to manage the cases. So, history. History taking is very important. History after taking history, and we should uh, give an in investigation for FSH and prolactin. And if the prolactin level is high, we should go for uh, pituitary imaging and TSH. If hyperprolactinemia is present, then uh, they should be treated with dopamine agonist, and uh, re really they may require surgery. If increased FSH level is there, then karyotype uh, sh typing should be done. And, uh, hyper, and this will diagnose hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism and they will need donor eggs. That, uh, that is class uh, three type of patient. And if there is decreased FSH and body weight, uh, we should measure body weight and pituitary imaging should be done. In, the, in these cases, hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism is there. So there will be weight gain. Uh, this uh, this uh, can be controlled by giving uh, pulsatile GnRH and gonadotropins. In case of normal FSH, uh, we should uh, do, uh, take body weight and pelvic scan, and this will uh, 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 this will show that is it is having normal gonadotropic anovulation, and uh, this can be controlled by weight reduction and giving letrozole or insulin sensitizing agent or gonadotropins or ovarian drilling. Now coming to the diagnosis, documentation of ovulation is very important and we can do it with uh, hormone assays like uh, urinary LH, FSH and estrogen assays, direct assays of uh, gonadotropin or steroid hormones in the serum, urine or saliva. They both have the potential of predicting ovulation and identifying the limits of the fertile period. Then evaluation of the peripheral changes preceding coinciding with or succeeding the ovulatory process. And we can do progesterone assays on 8th day and 21st day of a 28-day cycle. A rise of value from 1 nanogram per ml to uh, more than 5 nanogram per ml would be consistent with ovulation. So ultrasonography is a very important uh, 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 modality to diagnose uh, ovulation. So by ultrasonography, we can uh, see the size of ovaries and uh, depletion of eggs. Follicular tra tracking ovulation is deemed to have, a, if, there is, if we track follicle, then uh, we can assess that ovul ovulation is deemed to have occurred if the follicle reached a mean diameter of 18 to 25 mm and sub subsequently changed in size, shape, or sonography uh, density. The changes in ultrasound image of the follicle that rupture is disappearance a sudden decrease in size, increased ecogenicity, irregularity of follicular wall, appearance of free fluid in the calde sac of Douglas, and dis disappearance of sudden decrease in follicular size has been found to be the most frequent sign of ovulation. Sensitivity and specificity of ultrasonography to document any ovulation is 84% and 89% respectively, and accuracy is about 85%. Then anti uh, hormone testing is very important. It correlates well with the number of antral follicle. Levels do not vary with the menstrual cycle and can be measured independently of the day of the menstrual cycle and it decreases with age. Healthy women below 38 years with normal follicular status at day three of menstrual cycle have AMH levels of uh, to uh, 6.8 nanogram per ml, or you can say 14.28 to 48.55 picomoles per liter. High levels are found in patients with PCOD and comprises female fertility. Antral follicle count again predicts ovarian reserve of a particular patient, and this is counted by vaginal ultrasonography. Along with female is the best tool that we currently have for estimating ovarian uh, reserve is the ex expected response to ovarian stimulating drugs and the chance for successful pregnancy within with in vitro fertilization. Other tests that we can do is basal serum inhibin B. It should be less than 400 picogram ml associated with poor uh, ovarian reserve. 
so if serum inhibin b is less than 400 uh, picogram per ml it it indicates poor ovarian reserve we can do clomiphene citrate challenge test exogenous fsh ovarian reserve test gonadotrophin releasing hormone agonist stimulation test ovarian volume vascularity biopsy endometrial biopsy endometrial plate measurement can be done so what are the treatment options for group 1 that is hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism supervised programs for weight optimization so main most important uh, treatment is reduction of weight and we can give uh, gonadotrophins with lh regimens for who group 1 ovulatory disorders gonadotrophins with luteinizing activity are better at indu inducing ovulation than pure fsh fsh pre uh, preparation and the uh, pulsatile administration of gonadotrophin uh, uh, releasing hormone agonist should be given gnrh uh, is usually administered uh, subcutaneously 15 to 20 microgram usually every 90 minutes or intravenously 5 micrograms every 90 minutes in a pulsatile manner through a pump and in all in all in this uh, class of patient clomiphen is ineffective in the absence of an intact hypothalamic pituitary axis and therefore it is not appropriate as a treatment in this group of an anovulatory woman so in class uh, who group 1 type of patient the treatment is weight reduction and and to give gonadotrophin regimens now coming to treatment options for who group 2 normal gonadotrophic uh, and ovulation the this uh, group con consists of heterogeneous group of patients who can present either with regular cycles oligomenorrhea or even amenorrhea most of these patients are likely to have pcos that is more than 80% other causes include uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia adrenal tumors and and androgen producing ovarian tumors the patient may have clinical symptoms or signs of hyperandrogenism such as hirsutism we should require more detailed investigations such as measurement of dehydroepi androsterone sulfate and 17 hydroxy progesterone specific causes such as adrenal or ovarian tumors should be treated by removing the cause and congenital adrenal hyperplasia benefits from corticosteroid therapy so what is the aim of ovulation induction our aim is to induce follicular growth and this can be done by pharmacological agents which can initiate augment or modulate the hormones and gametogenic response of the ovary and, uh, and our aim is to overcome natural follicular selection process to increase the number and quality of oocytes available for fertilization and we can the uh, we can time intrauterine insemination time in an oocyte retrieval time so uh, before starting any protocol or ovarian stimulation analysis of ovarian reserve is very important and this also and this helps us to select the correct stimulation protocol and to de define the goal of ovarian stimulation so coming to the ovarian ovulation induction and controlled ovarian stimulation there are two general treatment strategies that focus on ovulation that is ovulation induction and uh, ovulation induction is mainly pursued in patient who are not ovulating this is important ovulation induction is in uh, is in those patient is done in those patient who are not ovulating monofollicular genesis is required in this condition in controlled ovarian stimulation For, are used for those women who are already having ovulatory cycle but are still experiencing infertility here we require multi follicular genesis both treatment in incorporate many of the same medications so uh, coming to the various medications or in oral agents we have clomiphene citrate and letrozole and these uh, basically causes pituitary fsh to stimulate the egg development while um, other are injectable agents like gonadotrophins fsh hmg hscg other other common fertility medic uh, medications are dopamine these are usually given to decrease prolactin 
and which which prevents ovulation implantation and may cause recurrent uh, pregnancy loss then uh, in certain patient we have to give levothyroxine which re restores thyroid hormones to normal levels and uh, in certain patient we'll have to give uh, metformin which lowers glue, uh, blood sugar level and it is used to treat, uh, treat type 2 diabetes and pre diabetic conditions as seen in polycystic ovarian disease so coming to the ovulation induction, the choice for uh, OI is dictated by hypothalamic pituitary acts, uh, ovarian function. With adequate hypothalamic function and oral regimen of clomiphene citrate, which exhibits estrogen agonist and antagonist activity is often utilized first. Clomiphene citrate inhibits estrogen binding in the hypothalamus to stimulate release of gonadal GnRH and pituitary gonadotrophins and induce ovarian follicular development. While oral or aromat aromatase inhibitors like letrozole are in causes increased release of GnRH and pituitary gonadotrophins through an estrogen antagonist effect. If hypothalamic or pituitary dis uh, dysfunction is detected or if uh, oral regimens are not successful, then we proceed on with injectable, injectable gonadotrophins. FSS uh, administered alone or in combination with LH. In, ca in case of injectable gonadotrophins, various re regimens are followed. That is step-up protocol, step-down pro protocol, and chronic low-dose protocol. So what is step-up protocol? It represents the natural prog progression of gonadotrophin release during the menstrual cycle. Initially, daily injections of 50 to 75 international units are increased in increments of 37.5 international units as necessary for a follicular response. Step-down protocol uses higher initial doses of 150 international unit until a dominant follicle is apparent on ultrasound. The daily dose is then decreased in incrementally until ovulation is triggered. So in, uh, so in case of injectable gonad gonadotrophins, we follow regimens like step-up step protocol, step-down pro protocol, and chronic low-dose protocol. Coming to the clomiphene citrate. A typical initial dosing regimen for uh, CC is 50 mg once daily for five days starting on day five of the menstrual cycle. Some cl clinicians may prefer initiating therapy on day three, although there is no clinical advantage. Ovulation typically occurs five to 12 days after the fifth dose is taken. If ovulation is documented but pregnancy does not occur, the same dose of CC is used in future cycle. If ovulation does not occur, then the dose is increased by 50 mg and with each subsequent cycle. Although the product labeling does not recommend doses above 100 mg per day, CC doses as high as 250 mg have been described in the literature, but uh, they may cause uh, over hyper, uh, hyper stimulation syndrome. Alternative medical uh, medication approaches are typically recommended if uh, daily doses of 150 milligram are not successful. So how to use? This is a diagram showing how to use uh, clomiphene citrate. We can start from the second day to fifth day and uh, we should go for ultrasound on 11th and 13th day to see the growth of follicle. Uh, how to increase clomiphene citrate dose that I have already described just now. What are the points to consider? PCOS occurs in more than 75% of anovulatory infertility. 25% of cases are clomiphene uh, resistant. 15% uh, of patients who ovulate have thin endometrial um, and poor mu uh, mucus. Ultra uh, sound monitoring is required in these kind of patient and those can be adjusted if necessary in subsequent cycle. And this allows endometrial evaluation also. In IUI, endometrial ap uh, appearance thickness is more important than follicular size for uh, SCG administration. Assessment for the risk of OHS is done during the treatment. So cumulative pregnancy, this is a diagram showing number of treatment of cycles and with these cycles, 
cumulative pregnancy rate increases. So aromata coming to arom aromatase inhibitors. The recommended administration schedule is similar to clomiphene once daily for five days, beginning on cycle day three to five. That is letrozole, we can give 2.5 to 5 milligram and anastrozole 1 milligram. There is re reduced incidence of multiple gestation in uh, this protocol. And uh, as compared with clomiphene citrate, because of the development of fewer follicles and pregnancy rates with letrozole appear to be similar to clomiphene. What are the adverse effects? Aromatose inhibitors do not affect cervical mucus or endometrial dev development, but this finding has not translated into improved pregnancy. Outcomes in clinical studies have shown that initial concerns of the teratogenic potential of aromatase inhibition during fetal development prompted a warning against use in premenopausal women who are of uh, or may become pregnant to be needed in the product layer. Methformin combined with the clomiphene citrate may increase ovulation rates and pregnancy rates, but does not significantly improve the live birth rate over that of clomiphene citrate alone. It is, it, ha, it, has been, it is seen that methformin when added to clomiphene citrate, especially in those cases with clomiphene citrate resistance uh, cases, this, uh, this will work, but uh, adding the, uh, Methformin in, uh, with clomiphene citrate is not uh, that useful as compared to when methformin is added to gonadotropin. So methformin in, may increase the live birth rate among women undergoing ovulation induction with gonadotropin. And it should not be used as first-line therapy for innovation. So most important thing is that methformin increase the live birth rate um, among women uh, undergoing ovulation induction with gonadotrophins and it should not be added with clomiphene citrate. Another drug is tamoxifen citrate. It is a selective estrogen receptor modulator and tamoxifen is used for ovulation induction for women with an ovulatory disorder. It is given at days 3 to 7 of a woman's cycle. Similar uh, structure is similar to clomiphene and study shows no difference as regards to ovulation, pregnancy, abortion, adverse effects rates. 20 to 40 milligram is the da uh, daily dose for five days and may be used alone or in combination with CC to act in synergy for better response or in cases of uh, resist uh, cases resistant to CC alone. It can be given in, with com in combination with gonadotrophins. So uh, to collect the uh, to select the correct stimulation protocol is very important, and most individualized protocol are based on the following parameters of ART. So CUS uh, uh, depends uh, mainly is depends on a, um, a BMI of the patient, and we should optimize response and out, uh, outcomes. And our aim is to minimize the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So uh, we should, uh, before going for uh, CUS, we, uh, we should assess age, FSH, AMH, AFC, and before deciding any protocol. So what are the prerequisites for ovarian, ovarian induction? Ovarian induction is in initiated on day three or, uh, or two or three, only if follicular size is less than 10 mm, or if there is no ovarian cyst, or if endometrial thickness is 6 mm. Why drugs should be started on 2 to 3 of the menstrual cycle as selection of dominant follicle uh, is required in early follicle phase. Types of ovarian stimulation for ART. Uh, it can be natural cycle or modified natural or mild or minimal stimulation or conventional standard routine love CUS can be used. Protocol is usually ba uh, is based on AMH and AFC. If in cases of uh, AFC where the count is between 24 to 40 or if the AMH is between 20 to 40, the, these patients are uh, considered a high responsive patient and uh, in these conditions, antagonist control and agonist tr trigger is required. In patient with normal response, that is when the AFC is between 10 to 24 or uh, AMH is 7 to 20, long down regulation agonist control or antagonist cycle is required. 
in case of reduced uh, response flare agonist is uh, helpful and in case of uh, negligible response oocyte donation is the best choice so ovarian response depends on presence of other infertility factors like genetic fsh and lh receptors polymorphism past performance to uh, control ovarian stimulation risk tolerance FSS sensitive follicle cohort type of stimulation regimen used and type of GnRH and analog use and the dose of gonadotrophins. So choosing the GnRH uh, analogs. So in case of non PCOS present patients, GnRH agonist long or short is required or GnRH, GnRH, GnRH antagonist protocol is used. While in PCOS cases, GnRS antagonist is the best because in these patient ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is uh, very much high. So GnRS antagonist is the best protocol to be used in polycystic ovarian syndrome cases. So uh, this is the stimulation procedures for agonists, long antagonist and minimal stimulation protocol for IVF. Now coming to GnRH antagonist protocol, it can be uh, given in a fixed uh, way or a flexible start multiple dose or a single dose protocol. In, fin uh, in a frist protocol, gonadotrophin is uh, uh, GnRH antagonist is given on the sixth day of the cycle. While in the flexible uh, start, the GnRH antagonist is started when the fo follicle size has attained 14 mm of uh, 14 mm size, then only the antagonist uh, is given started. Coming to the GnRH agonist proto uh, protocols. So, in GnRH uh, agonist uh, protocols, we have uh, long, long protocol, short protocol, and uh, ultra short protocol and micro dose uh, protocol. These protocols are for GnR GnRH agonists. So stand in normal uh, responders, which results uh, in uh, no uniform cohort, we follow long protocol. Here, the GnRH uh, agonist is started on the uh, 21st day of the previous cycle and is continued till the optimum follicle size is obtained. And the gonadotrophin is started just after the menstruation, that is on the second day of the cycle, till the um, optimum follicle size is obtained for the trigger. In short protocol, GnRH uh, agonist is started on the second day of the menstrual cycle and gonadotrophin is started uh, one day later. And these uh, both these uh, uh, drugs are continued till the uh, appropriate size of follicle is obtained for the trigger. In ultra uh, short protocol, oral contraceptive pills are started 12 to 21 days uh, before the from the previous cycle and GnRH agonist is given for only for three days uh, for, uh, and then gonadotrophin is started one day uh, later after start of the GnRH agonist and we can uh, add GnRH uh, antagonist if there is premature LH surge and uh, both this uh, gonadotrophin is continued till the optimum follicle size is, is obtained for the trigger. This is especially for the poor responders. And in uh, microdose protocol, oral contraceptives is started with, from uh, 12 to 21 days of the previous cycle. And then the OCP is, is stopped. And uh, after mens, uh, from the day three, uh, low dose of GnRH agonist is given 40 micrograms per uh, BD and then uh, GT is given one day later after the uh, GnRH agonist and these both these are continued till the optimum follicle size is obtained for the trigger. The, uh, the, uh, this is still under experimental stage and uh, this is usually applied in case of uh, poor responders. Now coming to the comparison between GnRH agonist and antagonist uh, pro protocol. In GnRH, long, long GnRH agonist uh, protocol, there is flare-up uh, effect 
and it, the treatment is longer. But in case of uh, the antagonist uh, protocol, there is no flare-up flare effect. And we can give a GIRH trigger in case of antagonist protocol, but we cannot, we can, cannot give in long G, GNRH agonist uh, protocol. So this is the advantages and uh, disadvantages of various uh, long and short protocol of uh, GNRH. Coming to the advantages of long GNRH agonist protocol, it forms uniform cohort and more oocytes can be obtained, increased pregnancy rate, and is, it is uh, suitable for normal responders. And uh, disadvantages are increased duration of COS, therefore increased cost, increased stress, financial, emotional, increased complication, and OHSS. Uh, coming to advantages of short GNRH agonist protocol, it, it, it utilizes the initial temporary eff uh, flare effect for follicular recruitment followed by pituitary desensitization. More it is more suitable for older patients and poor responders. It, re it reduces dose of injections and duration of COS. So, and disadvantages are, it is unphysiological, LH is increased in early phase only, and, and there is reduced pregnancy rate because of this premature LS surge as compared to the long protocol. Uh, and what uh, advantage of uh, GNRH antagonist protocol is that it is patient friendly and reduced uh, injection doses uh, and shorter duration of stimulation is required. And it has got minimal side effect and it reduces and it reduces risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Disadvantages are it uniform cohort of follicles may not develop, and increased dose of gonadotrophins may be re, uh, required once antagonist is initiated. Coming to the ovulation induction protocol. You can also add plomifen citrate with the gonadotrophins, and uh, maybe and uh, and uh, we can uh, monitor the follicular size. And if the optimum follicular size is obtained, that is around 18 mm, SCG trigger can be given. And after 35 to 37 hours, we can plan IUI. Con coming to the conventional step up protocol. This is uh, supraphysiological doses of uh, FSH and it provokes uh, initial development of large cohorts, stimulate additional follicles and even rescue those follicles destined to undergo atresia. And the other uh, protocol is step down uh, protocol. It helps in monofollicular development and uh, loading dose of FSH is 100 to 200 and then decrease by 37.5 uh, international unit every uh, three to five days depending upon the development of follicle. So um, uh, starting dose is high, um, high and then on seventh, fourth or fifth to seventh day, we do the follicle monitoring. If it is more than 10, around 10 mm, we decrease it by 37.5. Again, the scan is done after three, uh, um, scan is done after three days and if the optimum follicle size is obtained that is uh, around 16 mm we can continue the um, yeah, drug with the same level and if the optimum size is not, not uh, we can decrease the size and if the optimum size and we can con decrease uh, the size with 37.5 international unit and we can continue with the same amount uh, of uh, gonadotrophin till the optimum follicle size is obtained. Coming to the step, uh, step down pro on a, a protocol, uh, risk of multifolliculogenesis and OHS is reduced in case of sub step down protocol. And FSS threshold uh, dose de is decreased by 15% when leading follicle is 14 mm. Low dose protocol we can follow by two in in two ways. Starting dose is start, uh, is with thirty seven point five to seventy five international unit, and again the scan is done on the seventh day, 
if the optimum size of follicle is not uh, achieved then the dose is increased by 100% and then again the follicle monitoring is done and if uh, if the optimum follicle size is obtained that is more than 16 mm then uh, uh, ovulation trigger is given with uh, scg another in another uh, Type of protocol we can get, uh, start with the same 37.5 to 75 and a uh, scan is done on b7 and if the optimum size is not uh, obtained that is 10 mm then we can increase the dose by 50 percent and we can in, um, continue the same dose until the optimum size is obtained to for the trigger coming to the chronic low uh, dose protocol this is specially benefit beneficial for the polycystic ovarian uh, patient and this helps in reducing the uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Here, um, the uh, gonadotrophins are given uh, at a very low dose that is 37.5 to 75 international unit and this is continued till 14 days and after 14 days a scan is done and if, uh, if the follicle size um, is not obtained, then the dose is increased by 50%. And, uh, and again, the uh, scan is done on the 21st days. And uh, if the uh, for, um, optimum follicle size of 10 mm is uh, achieved, then uh, the same dose is continued. And if it is not achieved, then uh, again, the dose is increased uh, by 100% till the optimum uh, follicle size of 16 mm or more is achieved. Dose increment uh, can be done up to maximum 225 international unit per day. So, um, to conclude, I can uh, I want to say that evaluation of ovarian reserve mar marker is must before deciding any kind of protocol in these patients. It improves efficacy, safety, and cost effectiveness of treatment. It predicts response. It, it tailors co correct stimulation regimen for adequate response also to prevent complication and it also improves pregnancy outcomes. So let us know a few words about the uh, emerging role of N-acetylcysteine as a novel adjuvant to clomiphene citrate for ovulation induction. N-acetylcysteine is a promising agent. It is a safe and well-tolerated mucolytic drug. It has proven activity on insulin secretion in pancreatic cells. It acting as an insulin sensitizer. Anti-apoptoic activity and it has got protective action against focal ischemia at level of ovary. Apoptosis responsible for follicular atresia. So NSC treatment improves insulin sen in sensitivity, thyroid levels, and lipid profile in women with PCOS. N-acetylcysteine is proved effective in inducing and or augmenting ovulation in polycystic ovarian patients. NSC promotes lipid profile, hormonal levels, ovulation, and consequently the long-term health status of women with both PCOS and CC resistance PCOS through uh, inhibition of oxidative stress and improvement of peripheral insulin. So there's one study which shows that N-acetylcysteine may be a novel adjuvant to clomiphene citrate and more effective than clomiphene citrate alone in inducing and augmenting ovulation. And it could be used as an alternative to other insulin sensitizing agents like metformin. In one of the study, it has been shown that uh, addition to NAC to CC in ovulation induction leads to comparable pregnancy rate as letrozole. So, clomiphene uh, we can citrate in combination uh, with NAC has the same result uh, as letrozole in case of polycystic ovarian disease. Thank you. That is all for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for this uh, nice uh, presentation and uh, nice deliberation. Uh, just give me one minute time, ma'am, to check the questions, if any, in order.
Madam, uh, one question, ma'am. Uh, if you found any patient is having this poor ovarian reserve, so is there in that case, uh, is there any specific uh, protocol or uh, some approach is there? Yes, in case of uh, poor ovarian reserve, uh, we usually follow, uh, like I, I already told you, there, there are gonadotrophins protocol and GnRH analog protocol. In, in poor uh, ovarian reserve cases, we... Uh, if we are giving gonadotrophin, then we will have to, um, in case of GnRH and gonadotrophin, we should follow uh, ultra short protocol, uh, protocol or short protocol. So the, this is the um, best treatment for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And another question is, ma'am. Uh, uh, in case of uh, PCOS patient, so is there any uh, wait time to get the menstruation normal or uh, we can di directly uh, induct uh, this ovulation? So what is your thought on that? C uh, can you repeat the question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you wait for the normal menstruation for a PCOS patient or immediately you will uh, be doing this uh, ovulation uh, induction for that particular? If you want to ovulate, uh, induce that patient. In case of PCOS? Yes, yes, yes. Do you wait for some time or for, for first visit or something? No, no, we inside? can give uh, medicine for <laughs> withdrawal and if the, and we can start uh, the uh, medicine after withdrawal bleeding. Thank you, thank you. Mm. And... Uh, and ma'am, uh, one uh, question is uh, how to manage this uh, hyperstimulation means if there is any problem with the hyperstimulation. Mm -hmm. So what the parameters or what uh, things need to take care of for that? In case of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, if, uh, you, um, if, if the case is mild, mild cases, that can be managed at home only. Uh, and if there is um, severe cases, like in if a patient uh, develop ascites or uh, a pneumothorax or uh, electrolyte imbalance imbal or uh, starts going into shock, then such kind of patients should be admitted and uh, they should be monitored in the hospital and treated accord according to the symptoms. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, ma'am. I uh, could not find any other questions. So thank you once again for your valuable time on our platform Shield Connect and to discuss on this very important topic that is ovulation induction in PCOS. And in future also, ma'am, we will look forward for some valuable session with you in some other uh, topic of discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much, madam, uh, once again uh, for your valuable time.